I've written Star Wars movies, Raiders. I've written effects movies and never made one. And so I had directed nine movies without ever doing an effects movie. And I wanted to do it. And, and the advances in effects were only more enticing to me. You know, it became easier to do amazing things. In this film, Dreamcatcher, we had a wide variety of uh, tasks to undertake for Larry. There was five or six major sequences, and each had a different trick we had to come up with. So it really presented for us a wide variety of challenges, from the creatures derived from the original concept drawings by Crash McCurry to the big uh, ground battle sequence as well. Larry wanted to make something that was definitely alien, yet it had to look real. So our biggest challenge was to ground it in reality, and I think that was the difficult thing we had, because he didn't want it to look like a snake or anything that was earthbound, yet he wanted it to look like you could touch it. And so that was quite a challenge, because again, he was willing to go way out there. He said, you know, I want it to be strange, I want it to be something completely new. But on the other hand, I was very concerned with making it somewhat real. In the bathroom sequence, we had to work closely with um, the practical weasels. They shot with a puppet weasel that was being held and grasped and, and wrestled with. And then wherever the weasel had to turn and open his mouth and threaten, the CG puppet that we created was used to give it that impossibly quick response. So we had to kind of turn off our animator brains that say, oh, it's shaped like this, so it should move like this and kind of get into Larry's world, which was just a peculiar sort of motion that he had in his head that we had to try and capture. And it has a little bit of stretching and compressing, but then also the front two thirds of it or so are kept semi-rigid as it kind of snakes along and, and when it lifts its head. Then the animation is passed off to the technical directors who light the creature, apply all the textures, and actually place it in the scene and make sure the lighting matches and, and all that stuff. For the film, what we have is something that's called Mr. Gray A or Mr. Gray B. And all that Mr. Gray is, or Mr. Gray A, is the classic representation of what an alien looks like. As we got into the development uh, of this character, um, the director was really interested in seeing something that you know, took us away from this, this classic design, this classic alien design, and made it look more sophisticated. So we went this way for a while, and then at some point, Mr. Gray ended up with sort of a multiple layer kind of a skin look. We could see light operating on two different levels, both on the very surface of his skin and, and as it gets further into his skin. Mr. Gray B was more of a nightmare character. Um, and he kind of emerges out of the shell or the disguise that Mr. A uh, provides for him. And for Mr. B, we needed to develop um, mostly for the end sequence because up until then he'd been a fleeting glimpse. You saw him dashing about the memory warehouse, you saw him racing away from the mayhem in the, in the ground battle, but you never got a good look at him. And suddenly, in the final sequence, the way it evolved, he has a very big role to play, and his skin and texture and lighting became a big challenge. And uh, the movement was really interesting in terms of how to make that guy run and not look comical, because it is sort of, if you look at the dimensionality, it's sort of very much a, a, a comical creature if you, if you don't get it right. So, and also his, his level of his wetness and the skin and that, and, and going for some more translucency. So it, uh, overall, they were really unique creatures to work on and it's really satisfying to pre-create because even from a design standpoint it's like nothing I've ever seen in any in any science fiction film so that's quite neat. Blue boy group, this is blue boy leader. Target is imminent. Fire and will! Well, let me explain the ground battle sequence where 
Every shot had some CG work in it, but it was based a lot on aerial photography that Stefan did in Vancouver, above Vancouver in uh, Prince George. And it had a lot of uh, blue screen elements of the characters inside of their helicopters. All of the, the pilots were shot blue screen. But in that sense, it wasn't all CG. The, the landscape was um, primarily from plates, but we had to insert in there in many shots artificial portions of the landscape where the ship had scarred the landscape and knocked a chunk out of a mountain range and come to rest at the end of this valley. Um, what's unique about that whole sequence was we did almost every shot had some additional work put on it to give it that battle footage, kind of a Private Ryan look where we gave it some uh, consistently grainy, a little bit of shaky cam work on it. We had mist to make the blue screen um, elements that we shot of the pilots feel like they were part of the sequence. And then when we're outside in the battle, a lot of that became all CG shots. The ship. The Mr. B aliens being massacred. And the, all of the helicopters, whenever we were outside looking back at the helicopter, all of those were computer graphic images. The spaceship went through a lot of iterations with colors and surface textures. Everything from a very dull surface to very shiny, almost glossy, like a, like a lacquered look. Larry wanted the design of the alien ship to look like it was durable enough to have made it through space, but it did want to have a lot of texture and a lot of detail. In the end, we uh, settled down for sort of a combination of um, earth tones with some different sheen to it. There's a number of places where um, the, the uh, theme of the virus and the theme of the Dreamcatcher, you get glimpses of them that tie different parts of it together. The, the four kids plus duddits, when they um, form their friendship, they're in a pattern of a dream catcher. And you see a shot where you're pulling away from them and you see them, they've actually built a dream catcher. And um, you see it in the ship. And then you see it at the very end of the film where duddits has sacrificed himself to consume Mr. B. And that whole thing explodes in a virus cloud that floats away. And you get one last lingering glimpse of a dream catcher before it dissipates and you roll credits. I wanted every effect to feel that it was real. And part of making that work is to marry them perfectly to a digital creature, so that hopefully you can never tell where one leaves off and the other begins. I had a road accident in uh, June of 1999. I was out on my afternoon walk and a guy came along in a van. He was trying to deal with animals in the back of his van without stopping, so he was turned around and he hit me and it was, uh, it was serious. I, I broke most of the ribs on the right side of my body. Fractured hip, fractured pelvis, tibia fractured in nine or 10 places. Really, the guy described this area of my leg down here from knee to ankle is so many marbles in a sack. Are you okay? No, I broke my leg. Oh man, my damn leg. When I got started on Dreamcatcher, I couldn't really work on a word processor because it was too uncomfortable to try to sit at a desk for any period of time. But uh, I wanted to write because it's my drug it takes me away. When I'm writing, I'm in another world. You don't feel the pain or anything for that period of time that you're writing. So I had a bunch of ledger books and I wrote the book longhand. I've had people say to me, uh, I don't understand why you want to write horror stories all the time. And my reaction is I don't write horror stories all the time. I write stories the, the way that any novelist does about the relationships that people have with one another and the interactions they have with one another. I wanted to write a story that was pretty much set in one cabin. I want to write a story about guys uh, and what guys are like when they're on their own. And I visualized a hunting camp 
and I really wanted to write an old-fashioned monster story, an invasion from space type story. But the other thing that I wanted to do with Dreamcatcher is what you're looking for if you write stories that are scary, you're looking for the taboo zone. You're looking for a place where ordinarily the door is closed and we don't go beyond that door. And it used to be that the taboo zone was the bedroom, but eventually the movies got beyond the bedroom door. And I thought to myself, well, is there a door that's still closed anymore? And the answer was, yes, this is true. The bathroom door is a place that we don't go anymore. And I started to think about the bathroom as being a room where really a lot of nasty discoveries are made. I would guess that probably 60 to 70 percent of our first realization that maybe we have a tumor, we have cancer, that sort of thing, happens in the bathroom. You've done your number one and you've done your number two and you look in the bowl and there's blood and you say, uh-oh, I've got a problem. I don't want to see this, Jonesy. You can say, I wrote the whole book in order to have the scene where he sits on the toilet and he can't get off because the thing is inside, it won't go down because it's too big to flush. In a way, it was that scene that became the driving force of the book. It's going to do for the toilet what Psycho did for the shower. This is our 20th year coming out here to Hole in the Wall. And fuck me, Freddy, here's to 20 more. I don't think that it's by accident that when you see Dreamcatcher, there are scenes in that movie that call up Stand By Me. Because when kids do something together that gives them a common memory, they have more of a tendency to stay together. Hey. Huh? Hey, hey. So I wanted to write a story about some boys who had done something that was really extraordinary when they were young. And together, they have a secret, something that they've done that they just don't talk about, a sort of psychic link, a psychic bond. Duds can hear people's thoughts. We can't. Are you sure of that, Beef? Uh, what's the memory warehouse? <laughs> you don't remember the memory warehouse? I always said to myself, well, if you were taken over by an alien force, what happens to your mind? I think that in most cases, the, the mind would just simply be absorbed by the more powerful creature. But because I wanted my guys to sort of stand against these aliens. You're not Jonesy. And because they've had this encounter with this remarkable young man named Duditz, I thought to myself, well, maybe this guy's got a place to go. Well, if you want to know, why don't you just read my mind? Well, surprisingly, you're able to keep a few things from me. I don't understand it, but I'm sure I'll figure it out soon. And then I thought to myself, well, where would you go to escape the presence, the possessing presence? And I thought, well, your mind really is a little bit like a storehouse. It's a place where you have all these different cabinets. So I was able to visualize Jonesy running away into his own subconscious. But he has this one room where Mr. Gray, the alien, can't get in. It's a quantum leap from book to film. When it's the book, it's just me. I run all the railroads. I'm the casting director because I'm the cast, right? Uh, I'm the director, I'm the screenwriter, I'm everything. And action, Damien, action. You're always excited when you go in to see how someone is going to realize for the screen a story that you saw only behind your eyes, in your mind, that you were only visualizing and, and translating with the pen and the word processor. It's always exciting. I mean, the last thing that I thought of before I went to bed last night was I'm gonna see Dreamcatcher tomorrow and then I'll know if it's bad, if it's good, if it's indifferent. Thank God it's good. Sometimes I go back and read the books over. Once you get beyond a certain point, 
five, six, seven years after a book has been published, it seems less like yours and more like something that was written by somebody else. And then you almost read it as a novel by another writer. We're doing this interview in the year 2002, the fall of 2002. Come back and ask me what I think of it as a novel around the year 2009, and if I'm still around, I'll read it and tell you. <laughs> ¶¶